Hi, this is your host, Swamil Bharatiya, and welcome to our new show, Linux and Open Source Security. Today, we are going to discuss a new report, the state of vulnerability management in the cloud and on-premise. The report was sponsored by IBM's X-Force Red and was conducted by Ponemon Institute, LLC. To discuss this report, we have with us our regular, Pete Jarvis, VP of Business Development at Polyverse. Pete. First of all, it's great to have you here again. Swamno, it's always fun talking to you. I'm looking forward to the conversation today about the report. Uh, some of the results in there are pretty compelling and a little bit scary, I've got to admit, I agree with you. I think around April, um, the Institute, Poneman Institute, conducted the, a global survey of around 1,800 IT and security professionals. The findings were really uh, worrisome and disturbing. Uh, they found that more than 53% of organizations had a data breach in the past two years. And around 34% of those were of a criminal nature. Uh, what was even more worrisome was the fact that in most cases, patches were available, but they were not applied. Uh, uh, it, it, it's uh, it's kind of disturbing that more than 50% of respondents said that their organization, organizations are at a kind of disadvantage in responding to these vulnerabilities because they use manual process. There is no switch that they can flip. In some cases, it can take more than 28 days to patch once a critical or high-risk vulnerabilities detected on premise. So Pete, if you look at these numbers, everything is disturbing. And if you look at how long it takes to apply those patches, I think it's too little and too late. I mean, a lot can happen in those 28 days. So what I want to know from you is, let's talk about the risks of uh, delays in patching process. And, and uh, if you, how long does it take for a bad actor to exploit a vulnerability. How attackers use these vulnerabilities to compromise the systems, steal critical data, or can even damage some critical systems. <laughs> so we're gonna have fun with this. So how long does it take for a vulnerability to be exploited? Well, there's a number of ways you can look at that. So the first one is this, from the point where the patch is disclosed, it takes about 20 minutes for someone to take the patch, reverse engineer it to figure out the exploit. And so you have a really interesting problem is that you publicly disclose the exploit generally after you have released the patch. The problem is, is as soon as you release the patch, someone can reverse engineer it to figure out the exploit. So this is the core problem, the patch gap, because you know on average, the time between uh, the discovery of an exploit, the notification of the exploit, and the development and the distribution of the patch is about 97 days. Now, arguably, that number is trying to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But there's two issues. Um, on the front of that is the fact that the exploit exists, but no one knows. But some people might know, and that is a classic zero day. No one knows about it, but it works as an exploit. Now you get to the point where they discover the exploit and then you have this period of 97 days from the point where they go, ah, there is a problem to, okay, here's a patch, deploy it. But the real problem then is, is this long tail after the patch is deployed. So, so the reality is if you step back from that to your question, how do they attack? Um, how do they exploit? It's really easy. I just scan the internet. A real example is the Cayman Island bank hack where all they did was scan the internet for unpatched devices, and they found the device, which was a SonicWall uh, VPN server. Um, they found that one of the patches hadn't been deployed and that they could root the machine. That got them into the bank, and they extracted 200,000 pounds. As you mentioned, a lot of reasons that, hey, you know, weekend will cost you more, or we, you, I can do now, but you don't want any downtime. Can you also... Uh, uh, it's very easy to blame company like Equifax and any other company you know who had experienced that breach, but it's not that they 
the fact is it's not that they want the data to be compromised, not good for PR, it's not good for business, you know. It, it can also open a lot of doors for a lot of investigations. It's not that they want to do it, but there are a lot of legit, genuine reasons. You mentioned some. I just want to go a bit deeper into those, that what are the reasons that you have seen which affect effective patching in time? So, you know, Swapnil, patching in time is such a hard problem, um, but it's really a business problem. Um, and it's a business prioritization problem to me. You have uh, two components of the problem. One is, is business availability compared to IT responsibilities and prioritizations. And so the business basically has to work with IT to specify the priorities of what the important areas are and where the availability needs to be critical. Um, and that really does help. Um, today, though, it's very difficult because the business priority is availability of service. And if you don't have a good relationship between the business and the IT department, it becomes very difficult to have a strategic patching structure. Um, the other thing is budget. You know, um, a security budget now is somewhere between 4 to 11% of the over IT budget. And if you go talk to people about that, most companies um, are spending less than that. And that's understandable because it's a delayed risk. Uh, I think this is one of the important points of one of the problems with patching. If you think about all of the priorities for the IT department, it's sort of like, what is going to kill me first? And the thing that's going to kill them first is availability of service. So the second thing that might kill them is the risk of a cyber attack. But the reality is, is that is a... Um, you know, perceived risk, but it's not an actual risk. Where the servers going down is considered an actual risk because the business will be ringing up and saying rude, rude words to them. One more thing, uh, going back to the report is, and is this is something we cannot not talk about, is uh, containers, right? Everybody is, I'm pretty sure that this Zoom and, uh, session is running in some container at Zoom as well. Everything is container these days. Uh, and according to the report, I was just surprised that only 34% said that uh, they are using container. I assume that's more than that, but let's go with that number. But even out of those, you know, uh, they said that almost 57% say that they had no clue that uh, if the application running in those container was designed securely. And almost 56% said that um, uh, these applications, they're not sure whether these applications were tested to find and fix high-risk vulnerabilities that an attacker can exploit. If you look at container, in most cases, what happens is, of course, they're private repositories, but sometimes people just pick it from public repositories. You know, most cases, you know, when you're you will pick WordPress from a public, you know, GitHub repository. Now, you don't really know what is in that container itself. You know, there may be a lot of hard links. So, I, I mean, it, it creates a whole new set of challenges. But, of course, most companies, they run their own, you know, private uh, containers. So let's talk about container security. Also, uh, recent, you know, development in the industry. Uh, SUSA is planning to uh, acquire Rancher, right? It's still pending approval. Uh, which may conclude this year, which will have a big impact on security because SUSE, you guys work with them, you offer your polymorphing to, to make SUSE Linux even more secure. So talk about container security and also what what these kind of developments like you know, Rancher, which is a powerhouse in the Kubernetes space and SUSE coming together and then you guys are working. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, container security for a while. So I'll break this up into a couple of components. And it really comes down to supply chain integrity. So if you think of what is a container, what is a Docker container? Essentially, it's a set of layers. Um, the key thing is if you own the base layer of that container, everyone who's running off your container image that they increment on top of, then is basically relying on your software. And so what's really interesting is, um, as an example on the Docker Hub, um, 190 thousand of the um, accounts on Docker Hub were compromised. In other words, they got the passwords. And so what's really interesting then is, is you say, well, that doesn't impact me, but it does 
because now someone takes one of those compromised accounts, logs in, creates a new base container that becomes incredibly popular, but puts an exploit in the base container that is adopted by everyone. And at that point, you've thoroughly compromised the entire uh, IT infrastructure of a company. Now, you made a point that people use their own private um, Docker libraries, but the problem is, is they're still relying on public code. When you start looking at the containers, you have to start thinking about your entire supply chain what components you're putting into the container and how you're working it. And they don't even know what is running in their container. Uh, so uh, Pete, thank you so much for uh, talking about, first of all, I think this is the first episode of our new show, uh, Linux and Open Source Security. Thanks so much to, to discuss this report. And I look forward to talk to you again because we are going to cover all the topics that touch Linux and open source security.